one minute. All right, I see Ohio State. I see you guys. Oh, you got uh, quite a few participants. And I was just telling the other fellows that you were going to have some some people listen in just to kind of learn and pass on some knowledge. And you said that that's great. Yep. All right, so Ohio State, do you feel you got your most of your team represented there? You ready to ready to go? Uh, let's see. I think you got like nine people. Or so. Yep, looks like we've got everyone. Nope. Another one joined, so a lot of them. All right. Well, we will jump right in because I say it's uh, the, the, the clock is ticking already. So mm -hmm. um, the uh, first question, your overall design of your rocket contains multiple complex electronic systems. How did the team determine that all the electronic systems would successfully function simultaneously and were mutually compatible under actual flight conditions? And some of the concerns would be EMI and EMC system testing or other testing. So I'm Isaac, I'm the avionics lead. Um, specifically for interference, the, for electromagnetic interference, we have the Bluetooth uh, module, the GPS transmitter and the telemetrum. Uh, so those are the only things we have doing electromagnetic communication. Uh, the Bluetooth is in the 2.4 gigahertz band. So that's pretty far away from the 70 centimeter band that the telemetrum and the telegps we use. Uh, and then the telemetrum, we, for flight, we don't attach an antenna uh, since it's inside the carbon fiber body tube anyway. Um, so that will prevent that from interfering with the telegps. Uh, and then we also did two flight tests and we were able to get successful tracking and successful Bluetooth without any problems. Okay, any, any additional ground testing or was it just strictly based on the flight test? Yeah, we did uh, ground testing as well. Um, we didn't do any long range ground testing um, for GPS tracking, uh, but the flight testing uh, proved successful. Okay, Steve, are you good with that? Yeah, so so basically in a nutshell, I mean, not in a nutshell, uh, you, 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 the, the systems functioned in close compatibility, in close contact with each other in, in, within the airframe, and, and you, you satisfied yourself that, uh, that things were, were happy, even though potentially some performance degradation could have, could have been occurring, occurring that you, you weren't aware of? Yeah, that's something we didn't have time to test this year, um, but that would be, definitely be something that we could try to look at in future years. Okay. All right, we'll go on the next one. Um, so you had a vibration acoustic and strength of materials experiment you were going to fly on a 10K flight. Uh, did you fly that? And if so, can you give us some updates on results from that? Yeah. So the vibrational, as you saw, I included some of the data analysis we did afterwards in the report. We haven't dug into that too much since then. Um, just that was really late in the school year, so we didn't quite get the chance to really dig into it. I'd love to look at it a little bit more next year, just to kind of understand like the vibrations and the accelerations that you'll see during flight and then possibly even expand it. We're looking at launching our NASA rocket. So it'd be great to be able to even try to continue that in the next year or maybe on the next spaceport rocket. But I think that's sort of the limit was mostly the initial post-flight analysis of getting some understanding what the acceleration was. And sadly, the microphone we were flying uh, failed to record just due to some power, a button issue. Oh, sorry, I'm Joey Cayley, the, the pay to leave. Thank you, Avi. But, uh, quick follow up on that one. Sorry, uh, Joey. Did you so so you you do anticipate flying it for the? Um, uh, did you say you you do anticipate flying the payload in an upcoming launch or what was the? I don't know honestly. It really depends on what next year's uh, team decides. I love to think we could continue this experiment. I think I really as I dug into this more this year, there was a lot of just stuff I really only scratched the surface of because a lot of it was like every year's payload. We do try to make it novel each year. So it was very much so a lot of building from the ground up and I was, we were really learning as we go. So I thought that I'd, I, we kind of really scratched the surface this year. And I'd really love to dig into that possibly, but I honestly don't know what's going to happen next year. That really comes down to Sarah, our next year's lead. Are you graduating? I'm not. I will continue. I'm going to stick around, but I'm moving into the role as outreach director. Okay. All right. I was just, I was just more curious. So yeah. You're, you're welcome to move on. You don't need our permission. So. 
Um, okay, next question. Um, you did. You guys did testing of a 75 millimeter motor. And you compared that to your 54 mil, uh, millimeter motor, and the test results did not follow your predictions from your burn sim softwares. The scaling factor was off, from what I recall in your report. So the question is, why not? And then the follow-up question that would be is, how can you then proceed with confidence that the 98 millimeter uh, results would be as predicted if the other ones weren't? Hi, Todd. My name's Casey. I'm the propulsion lead. Um, so I don't know if you know uh, Gary Dickinson um, or Todd Knight. They're both in uh, Tripoli. Uh, so they're our advisors that we work with heavily for motor development. Um, so yeah, you're right. We, we did have, uh, we did experimental tests, uh, characterization, characterization tests with 54 millimeters. And then when we did our 75 millimeter motor burns for our uh, exhibition and test flights, the results didn't track. Um, we, we haven't, really dug too far into that due to, um, you know, the school year ending right after we finished our tests. Uh, we believe um, in talking to some other uh, people within the experimental uh, motor community that are, we had a very high concentration of magnesium mesh uh, and strontium nitrate. And those two combined, especially just a large amount of magnesium uh, contributed to that scaling factor not being as linear as what we predicted. Um, so you asked about the 98 98 millimeter motor, um, you're right, we, we couldn't guarantee the safety of it. That's why we didn't do the test. Um, that we thought, looking at the data of how the 75 millimeter scaled, um, and we were like, okay, this 98 millimeter motor would probably blow up. Um, and yes, it could have, you know, blown up and we would follow our safety protocols and we could have just done it and seen what happened. Um, but, you know, why, why even have the risk? Why lose a casing? Uh, so we didn't conduct that test this year due to the competition being canceled. And we figured why, why, why waste the money and why have the risk of doing it when we can spend a whole nother year um, analyzing and doing more tests so smaller scales and then scaling back up. Okay, so I think that's fair. So that, that says you're, you're acknowledged that there's some issues there and you got a year to work on it. Is that what I'm hearing? Yep, exactly. We think it traces back to that magnesium and uh, long length diameter ratio motors. So we're using a, a very long eight grain motor. Uh, so we're going to investigate that more with smaller motors and then try to scale up from there. Okay. All right. I'm going to go on to the next one and, and I'm going to cheat and say you can't, you can't answer, uh, you can't give me the same motor answer. I'm going to ask for something different. But, so if I told you your mission flew, but it failed, what would you expect it to be most likely caused? And based on that, what have you done to address the failure mode? That's why I say, Adam, the motor was an easy answer, so I'm not going to let you give that answer. Um, I'm going to jump in here. I'm Avi. I'm the uh, project manager for the team. I would say the thing that um, would be the most likely to fail the recovery system out of everything that we've got um, I think that's what everyone's been the most concerned about, uh, and rightfully so. Um, as for fixes, um, the the biggest thing that we've had questions on is the ejection charges and their ability to perform properly at the you know desired altitude of the flight. Uh, we've had a couple people express concerns on that, and although we haven't had uh, issues with them burning fully in the past at the 30,000 foot altitude, um, we would like to do more extensive testing in the future on, on making sure that those, you know, actually uh, burn fully and ignite properly. Okay. Any, any other areas in the team anyone wants to add in or is that good answer as any? Technique of, of a pre-mortem, right? You're all, we're all familiar with a post-mortem. After something has happened, you, you try to figure out why. But this is, this, is, this is a way, this is a technique of actually, you know, flash, flashing forward. What's gonna go, what's gonna go, what's likely to gonna go wrong in a, in a, in a month when we fly this? Um, I, and I'm, and I'm you, you guys had two, two successful 10K flights, uh, right? Is that a correct statement? And I'm re recalling. And, and your recovery system functioned under those conditions. Is that accurate? Um, but, but, but your, Avi, your, your answer was specifically about the, the 30,000 foot version of those tests that hasn't yet happened. Exactly. Okay. All right. Um, we'll go on to 
go on to another one, which is a little more generic and kind of special for this year. So uh, COVID presented many unique challenges to the competition. Can you briefly describe any unexpected opportunities and any unexpected challenges that COVID presented to your team's process and preparation? Yeah, so I can uh, talk about that. Uh, my name is Zach, I'm the uh, structures lead. And I think it created a big challenge for structures. Um, I think a lot of a, a lot of other sub teams can kind of work outside of the workshop and kind of get some work done in other places. Uh, for structures, that's not really possible. We need all of our tools in the workshop and all of our materials there. And I believe twice during the year, we were basically closed off access to our workshop and not allowed to meet there and work um, when we wanted to. And that did create a lot of challenges. Uh, I know I planned on doing some, some different testing, some uh, torque testing on our pieces um, and that we just never had a chance to do that just due to the uh, time constraints because we were cut off. But it did kind of grant some opportunities to do some more education in the structure side. Because we couldn't meet in person, we were forced to have online meetings. And during those online meetings, uh, we kind of tried to focus on, on, on a more scientific approach and, and educate some team members more, um, at least me, in terms of uh, structures. So it kind of had its ups and downs in different sides, but it was definitely a big change for us. <laughs> Okay, well, good answer. Any any other any other input from anyone? Yeah, I can build off of that. I'm Joe again, uh, payload lead. I really actually appreciated kind of the it sort of it did push us to sort of explore the spaces. Like as Zach said, that's not great for structures, but for like payload, it's actually really nice because I know it opens up accessibility because our lab is off campus. It's kind of difficult to say like, hey, join our team. It's only a five minute drive that you have to carpool with us for versus like oh. The payload team, though, we're just going to meet in Scott Labs, for example, in our the space we have there that we don't really use that much. So we're going to say, hey, just come to Scott Lab at like two on a Sunday. And it's a lot easier to get people in there and working rather than trying to communicate carpools and getting people off campus where like you're adding that hassle. Just it really opens up the team to more people and makes it more accessible, which I was really grateful to do this year. All right. Any other thoughts? Oh, just adding on to what Joey said, another thing is we were forced to meet in smaller groups, which was kind of an opportunity um, because we really could take up more space when we were working. And I felt like having a designated lab time for each of the sub teams uh, was also helpful. So what will you change for next year? How many things, would, what would we be doing next year that you wouldn't have expected two years ago to ever be doing and now you're going to be doing it? I'd say probably really using that on campus space just a little bit more. I still really think we missed out on the team bonding this year that we got in previous years where we all met at once. But like Isaac said, maybe like breaking up like specific times in lab for each sub team or spending some time on campus doing it, just sort of a nice way to sort of uh, let us allow her to like just focus on a small group and then either like open up accessibility on campus or like focus a, a bit more tightly as a group in the lab when we have the chance. Okay, very nice. All right, well, I, I will say I enjoyed reading your report. You guys did do some good work and uh, wish, wish we'd all been out in the field watching you fly right now. We'll, we'll see you next year. Anybody else, Steve, Chris, any other comments you'd like to add in? Thanks, appreciate it. Yeah, I enjoyed, I also, I enjoyed your reports, enjoyed uh, the presentations and uh, look forward to seeing you out in the field uh, next year. Good yeah. job. Yeah, and we had we saw your post your podium session yesterday too was also kind of very intriguing. So yeah, appreciate it. Nice.